So how take us up to the point where the cracks started happening, you know, uh, so let's go up to that point. So I I need to backtrack just slightly. Um, When the prop eight stuff was going on. Oh, you were. So I. I You were in Washington. Yes, I was was in Washington and I. I don't know if I was on the city council at the time, but I was very much like politically, I use the word radicalized now. I didn't think of myself as radicalized at the time, but always very politically conservative. Uh, I felt that politically conservative uh, positions were consistent with gospel teachings and uh, adopted... Uh, a lot of libertarian positions at the time. And so on the one hand, I don't want the government in people's lives any more than necessary. And then we have the government telling gay couples that they can't get married. So there was there was a little conflict between what I personally felt was correct and what the church is pushing and teaching. That didn't cause me to think the church isn't true or to doubt anything, but that was a, I don't. You're like, why is the church involved in this? I think that was part of losing the zeal too, right? It was, it's not something that I really can get behind. Like, I don't understand. So in 2013, I'm called to be bishop and I don't know exactly when it was, probably within the first couple of years of being bishop, there was a policy change with respect to gays. Uh, 2015. And mm-hmm. we were having a discussion in ward council about it because, of course, the church was going to take a lot of heat. This was a controversial thing. And I was I was pointing out to members of the ward council that, you know, a lot of people are going to compare this to how the church changed its position on the blacks and the priesthood, that eventually the church is going to change its mind about homosexuality. And I was trying to explain that this is different. It's not going to happen. And I was using the teachings that I had received growing up to justify and to explain that. And a member of the ward council raised his hand and gently pointed out, well, I'd be a little bit careful there uh, the church has disavowed those teachings and <laughs> the, ra- the racist teachings the racist yes teachings. and in that was the first that i had heard anything about that and and it didn't compute like what i don't know what you're talking <laughs> yeah. about so anyway wait can i uh, can i pause you for just please. a second so so uh just because i really like timelines and i really like to highlight the bubble So I started Mormon Stories in 2005. The podcast starts growing. Uh, Other podcasts come online. CES Letter at some point comes online. The church comes out. Actually, before CES Letter, the church comes out with its gospel topics essays around 2013. CES Letter comes out around 2014. Kate Kelly, um, you know, her disciplinary council starts happening around 2014. She's excommunicated in 2014. I'm excommunicated in 2015. All of this happens along with all the other excommunications and, you know, all up leading up to the, the November 2015 policy. So to what extent had you guys heard of any of this stuff, had opinions about podcasts, blogs, church history, the gospel topics essays? Did any of that hubbub, international press, uh, any of that penetrate your Mormon bubbles up to 2015? Uh, In general, no. The only thing that I could say maybe I was aware of was that there were some unruly women somewhere. (laughs) Somewhere in the church there were some women causing trouble. And I didn't. You wouldn't have even known Kate Kelly's name. I don't know. I don't think so. Oh, well, I knew Kate Kelly's name. And you thought. But, and I thought it was wrong. Well, I didn't know what was really behind it. I just heard what the church said about it. Yeah. Which um, was? Which was that she was out of line or that uh, it comes from the brethren. It doesn't come from, you know, she's not allowed to make changes like that. And I didn't even realize all they were doing was saying, hey, could you ask God if it's okay? You know, I 
so I didn't realize that part of it. And, um, and when she was excommunicated, I kind of thought, well, like I, she shouldn't be surprised because she's fighting <laughs> against the church. Right. And I hate that. I thought that, you know, I have these regrets about things I thought and said as a, as a Mormon, but. And, and part of that that's interesting to me is that your spirit was kind of feminist. You, Absolutely. You were having these feminist impulses all along the way. Mm -hmm. You were mm -hmm. packing them down. Yep. Kate and all the women fighting for ordained women were trying to uh, enact change in the church that would help elevate your voice so that your right. conscience and desires weren't as muted so that the patriarchy would be weakened a little bit and women could be elevated. But you had, I guess, inter internalized sexism? Is that? Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's what I mentioned earlier. I definitely did because um, I couldn't see her cause for what it was. And I think sometimes when you're packing something down, deep down you want something like that equality or but you don't get it it's easier to criticize those who are trying to get it does that make mm -hmm. sense yes kind of a psychology thing of what we do to make us feel better about the fact that we don't want have something we want deep down so i think i was doing a little bit of that just mentally yeah mm -hmm. i never heard of mormon stories never yeah. heard of CES letter, not even the gospel topic essays. I mean, the church didn't advertise them, right? So as bishop, as bishop, as bishop you didn't know about the gospel uh, topics essays? So I... And by the way, let me it's just not say, like you're some Idaho farmer. Right, right. Like you, five years at Microsoft, right. super, you know, not yeah. just tech savvy, but a programmer. Savvy with computers. This is 2015, yeah. 2013, 2014. Internet. You know how to use the internet, and your bishop. Right. And I, well, I wasn't looking. That's for sure. <laughs> um, I don't know that. Like it never registered that such essays exist. But I'm super busy. I'm a bishop, and I already know the gospel. I already know church history. I graduated from institute and a church university. It went like. There wasn't something missing that I was looking for, and so what would be the purpose in going out? So I don't know exactly when somebody ever mentioned for the first time to me gospel topic essays, but I know in 2015 it was news to me that <laughs> the church had disavowed some of its <laughs> teachings. I really, should, really quick, did 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 you guys want to say Sam Sam Jr. Were you wanting to say something really quick? Well, yeah, I don't want to just repeat the point, but personally, in terms of the bubble around my experiences, I think that I mentioned briefly that I kind of started getting involved in philosophy and politics and started exploring ideas. And I not only knew how to use the internet, but I used it um, naively, unsuspecting, or not, just not suspecting the the possibility of real like legitimate criticisms of the church because again when you when you have experiences when you're trained this is the church you know you can think there will be criticisms but you know I'm secure in my knowledge of the validity of the church um so I think that me actually exploring ideas of philosophy made me as a 12 13 14 year old actually feel like well I'm enlightened. Like I, I know the ideas there are, and I understand that there might be some criticisms of the church, but that's okay. So I think the first time that I actually ever discovered, uh, independently discovered something that made me wonder about the church just just a little bit was during my freshman year of high school. We, I was actually um, at public school at that point, and I was looking at the news, and there was an article about the Mormon church changing its uh, position on like uh, homosexuality in terms of apostasy. And so, uh, yeah, I basically had the same experience overall, but the, the internet, I think, played a slightly bigger role in the things beginning to change just a little bit for me. And you want to add Olivia to all this? Um, did you hear about Kate Kelly or ordained women or any of that feminist stuff? Yeah, I did. And I think I'm like my mom where I have a feminist spirit. I mean, I remember like going to activity days, you know, as a little girl and just being mad that I couldn't play basketball with the boys and scouts because I was so much cooler and we had to sit and do crafts and talk about girl <laughs> things. And so I definitely, um, I think part of my personality is just what um, maybe like made me, I was always very interested in like social justice, like from a really young age. Um, and I did, I did stumble across like the church essays as I, 
probably at 14, um, just in doing a lot of research. And there was a, I had a ton of internal conflicts um, with feeling like I needed to believe and I needed to be a perfect Mormon and realizing that, like, I wasn't and I really never had been. And I was trying really hard for years to become that person. And so I, I did a lot of research. I was always, like, reading the scriptures and trying to do what I was supposed to do, even though none of it was working for me. And, um, yeah, knowing about these things that no one else seemed to care about, even if they did know about them, was really hard for me. Um, and, like, our ward youth group was really small. It was me and one other girl at one point. And so I didn't have a lot of support there. Um, I was homeschooled through middle school, and so I kind of became really socially isolated and so all these internal struggles, I wasn't able to talk to you guys. Um, the times I do remember attempting to, it was very, like, shut down. Like, what are you saying? Stop. No. And so that was... About what topics? Um, I remember, so I I, um, I don't really like labels, but I, I, I had feelings for a girl uh, when I was 14. I kind of started to realize that I wasn't just straight. And... Um, so I, I started to really care about LGBTQ issues, and I while was, your dad's bishop, yes, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I remember uh, bringing that stuff up a little bit, and I was, you know, of course, it was always like that's so unnatural, and that's not God's plan, and I, I felt very misunderstood, and so I think I had a lot of resentment, um, a lot of resentment towards church leaders and towards you guys, which. Um, kind of just put me in like this downward spiral because girls camp became progressively less fun every year um, because I felt like I was just surrounded by people who were different than me. And I, and that's okay, but I felt like I wasn't able to be myself. I wasn't able to express who I was. I always felt just kind of trapped. And yeah, my dad being Bishop didn't help. <laughs> mm. And I was not supportive. No. I was not helpful. Uh, so I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, it took a lot of forgiving though. I remember when, um, it was about a year ago that dad was like, um, so I'm leaving the church and there has been, well, we'll get there. We'll <laughs> get there. We're not there yet. Yeah. But, um, no, it definitely took some forgiveness of like people change and that's okay. And it's been really healing. So, so there's, okay. So there's hope to the story. Yes. <laughs> That's nice. Um, so we're talking about those unruly women. And uh, so I think I was aware that there was some kind of movement. And I would have offered at least this argument. This church is led by God. If God wants to make a change, it's not, we're not led by grassroots movements. <laughs> God will, it comes from the top down, not the bottom up. Uh -huh. And I really believe that. And, and thus, even if, Maybe it would be better if women participated more fully and equally in the church. That's not the way the church works, which is the church's line, right? Um, so I find out in 2015 that the church has disavowed former teachings. I read the essay. The Race and the Priesthood the essay. The Race and the Priesthood essay. And it As a bishop. troubled me. Did it? It did. Why? It troubled me. Why? Uh, at least two reasons. The first is that... God can be a racist, but he can't disavow himself. And I, and it wasn't that I wanted a racist God, and I never thought of the LDS Church as racist or its doctrines as racist or myself reading the Book of Mormon and supporting what it says as racist. Never would have occurred to me. Um, now, as now I understand it, it is very racist, and, <laughs> and God is racist. But so there's racism in the in the scriptures that I had become accustomed to and and just let slide. So I was comfortable with the racism at at some level, but I'm not comfortable with God disavowing Himself. So that was massively troubling for me. And the the second part of it was the church's blatant dishonesty in how it presented the issue, and by that I mean. This was racist doctrine. 
<laughs> this was absolutely the church's teaching. And now in this essay, they're trying to tell me that it was just the racist theories uh, of past church leaders, that it was never doctrine. So both of those things um, were very heavy for me, but I knew the church was true. <laughs> and therefore, I, I don't know what to make of that, but I, I set it aside. And I really think it was because I was bishop. The, the, the sense of duty that I felt, all of the social pressures, the family expectations and pressures caused me at that point to just set that aside. And so I tucked my head down and I pressed forward. And I did my best, but that was now you're packing things down. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. That that was there. That was troubling. Have fun I, with that. No. <laughs> and I noted, I started noticing him be depressed, which is not his personality at all. It's I've never seen him like that. I thought maybe he was just getting burned out being bishop. It's hard, but I could sense the weight. He didn't want to go to the temple with me anymore. I could. I thought he was just well. If you're bishop all the time. Of course, you don't want to spend your extra time going to the temple. Like, I just thought it was that. I didn't know, you know, that it was troubling him. But I knew something was wrong. Yeah, things were changing internally. Um, so it's kind of weird to think about have, having a faith crisis begin when you're bishop. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, this isn't because I think my story is important, but I'm just curious— had you guys heard about Mormon stories or my excommunication leading up to that? No, I not at not. all. Um, we, okay, so we had traveled back and forth between Washington and uh, Utah and Idaho and Utah, and so at some point, I know I saw billboards. I don't know exactly when those went up, but I didn't go to the website or anything like that. I didn't at that. Like, I didn't feel like I had a, was having a faith crisis. I didn't admit to anybody my concerns. When this happened, I didn't talk to Sarah about it. I didn't say, hey, did you know? What do you think about this? We didn't have that discussion. I just uh, kept that to myself. Yeah. I mean, it's just weird that, like, the New York Times tweeted my excommunication, but Orthodox devout Mormons living in Utah or an adjacent state are so in the bubble, they wouldn't hear about something that was kind of international news, whether it's Kate Kelly or me or Jeremy Runnels or any of these other excommunications, just the bubble is real and it's super powerful. Yep. And if I had heard about you or anybody else being excommunicated, I would have thought, I guess they got what they <laughs> needed to get. <laughs> they must've been doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah. I, the church is always right. Yeah, okay. So how did things progress? So I, like I said, that troubled me, but that did not destroy my testimony. I wasn't, I wasn't faking it as bishop. I was still trying my best to um, serve and testify and be close to the Spirit. Uh, and then the time came for changes to be made in the leadership and I was released and then immediately called to be on the high council. And I got my high council assignments, which included serving in the Spanish branch. I don't know Spanish. I do love language and I sincerely tried my best to learn uh, Spanish and to participate in the Spanish branch as much as possible. Uh, but this had the effect of allowing uh, my church burden was greatly lightened moving from bishop to high counselor. And I guess because I didn't know Spanish, I had more time for my thoughts to <laughs> wander. And in that time, I revisited that essay. I mm. went back and I started thinking about it again. And... Had you had any friends or siblings or cousins leave the church? Had you been, had either of you been exposed to any apostasy of any friends, family, ward members, et cetera? Even as bishop, had you had to counsel anyone who was losing their faith? Or, or was this just like the first time, just the idea of it even being possible to lose your faith, 
even occurred to you? I had a brother who became an active uh, when I guess when he was a teenager, and I was probably on my mission when that became apparent or public to the family. So I'm at like a spiritual high while that's going on. Um, it's never been discussed as a family. It was certainly damaging. Like it creates distance. It it's. I don't have that in common with him all my life. And so, yes, I had a family member that was in an apostate. Um, in terms of counseling people. And you were distanced from him as a result. Yeah. I, I, I felt like anytime he wants to come and be a good <laughs> member of the church, then we can welcome him back. Maybe but not explicitly then, in those terms, but. Your relationship with him during. So much. After of, his apostasy was what? Well, I had gone up to Provo. We physically we weren't in the same location anymore, and so there was some natural separation that happened that way. But when we did get together, it was an unspoken divide. Like, what happened to you? Mm -hmm. Unanswered questions. What happened to you? Like, where did it go? You go wrong. Where did you lose your faith? But you didn't ask those didn't questions. Right, ask unanswered questions, questions <laughs> that were never asked. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and were you cl distanced from him as a result emotionally? Like, was your relationship kind I of? I think I tried to befriend him, but at the same time that you're trying to have that relationship, there's this problem over elephant here. In the room. Yeah, elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. Like, and he never tried to tell you no about doubts or problems. Or... No, and there was one time when we had all gotten together at my parents' house, and I was in the car. Um, taking him to the airport. He lives in Southern California. And I, because I'm this d devoted member of the church, I, I got up the courage to try to broach the subject. And I, I asked him, and it was very apparent he was uncomfortable with it and didn't want to talk about it. And so I dropped it. And uh, We're really good at not talking about the yeah. elephant yeah. in the room yeah. in yeah. Mormonism. Yep. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so back to you. Now you're starting to... So I'm revisiting my that question. And I, so I go back and I think about it uh, again. And no, this just does not work for me. Okay, and this is what year? This would have been... Well, you were released 2018. 18. So probably still 2018. So two years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and... One of the things that we're taught is that criticism of your church leaders is the first step on the high road to apostasy, mm. and I think that's right. <laughs> but I I allowed myself to be critical. Like, that's not okay. The church is lying to me. And uh, I didn't know about most of the racist history, actually. Like, I had this vague notion that there used to be a priesthood ban, but we took care of that. That's in the past. There's nothing else to it. Uh, I started doing research. I had previously voluntarily kept myself in this bubble because I had been taught you can't trust anti-Mormon lies. You mm -hmm. can't uh, read anti-Mormon literature. It, there's nothing good that will come from that. It'll just destroy your faith. And I had voluntarily kept myself from information that I probably could have found if I had uh, not had that attitude. I read the, uh, some of the other gospel uh, topic essays, Book of Abraham. Uh oh, oh okay, wait. <laughs> so you start, you go down the rabbit hole. Yes. Kinder <laughs> Two years ago. Kinderhook Plates, that blew my mind. What about it? That Joseph Smith claimed that he translated a portion of these 19th century fabricated a plates. Okay. Like he got caught in a in a lie. Yeah. And so What about Book of Abraham? What what did you For those who don't know anything about this. Yeah, so the same thing, caught in a lie, where when Joseph was claiming to have brought forth translated the Book of Abraham, the papyra, the pi, from yeah, the Egyptian. Exactly. Mm -hmm. People didn't know Egyptian. And so how is anybody going to tell him he's wrong? How is any, anybody going to challenge him on that? And as a linguist, as yes. someone who translates languages, <laughs> yes. Yes. that's that's kind of serious business for you, right? Yes. And once again, 
the church is, as I see it, wild dishonesty in how they try to spin what's happening. Uh, where now, before it was always, there was the papyri and it was translated. Mm -hmm. And now we have this catalyst theory where the papyri what was just a, a mechanism to bring forth inspiration mm -hmm. and that just doesn't why, work. Why didn't you me. like that? I mean, God, God's powerful. <laughs> God works in mysterious ways. Well, I think it's, it's, it was that literalist. <laughs> there's that, there's that. And why didn't we know that before? Yeah. Why are we coming up with this theory now? Mm -hmm. And why aren't you teaching this stuff in seminary? Mm -hmm. Why, why is it that I'm learning about this? nearly 40 years old for the first time as a 100% all in member mm -hmm. of the church. Former bishop. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And what about the book of Mormon translation stuff? Same thing. So Same thing. For those who don't know. Um, well, so there's so much, so much to it, right? <laughs> so in the text of the book of Mormon itself, there's anachronisms that horses you, and yeah, steel. Exactly. Archaeological problems, linguistic problems, Genetic um, problems. Genetic, the, the yeah, the DNA evidence. Mm -hmm. um, Which all shows what? It's fiction. It's not Joe a why? historical document. <laughs> Spell it out for those who don't okay. know. Okay, well, uh, so many things. So, um, <laughs> if if the book of the text of the Book of Mormon mentions horses, which it does, but there were no horses in the Americas during the time frame of the Book of Mormon. Because the Spaniards brought them over yeah, they in had, the 1500, 1400s. They had existed in the Americas before the, the Book of Mormon the, times. The long Plasticine time, exactly, era. Like, long right. time ago. Ice Age stuff. And were ex extinct, right. right? And so there were no horses. And then Joseph Smith's environment included horses in the Americas. And so he writes it into the text of the Book of Mormon. He doesn't know any better. Along with wheat and... Yes, and on and on know, and on. Barley and... And, um, and I, swords and you right, know, right, yes, metal yeah, yes. and right. helmets. helmets and shields and it, wheels. And and millions <laughs> of people being involved in military conflicts. And you think about the uh, food supply, like, like the logistic supplies that would be necessary to support armies like that. And there's zero evidence, archaeological evidence of any of this. Mm -hmm. It's just spun out of the air, out of nothing. And I can't believe... It like it never even occurred to me. I feel embarrassed. I feel embarrassed. Um, but well, the, and when you learn about at that time, a lot of people were thought the mound builders were white and trying to hmm. explain the whole Native Americans and they couldn't have done these wonderful things. It, like it's built on the dark, racism. the dark, the mm -hmm. dark native Americans couldn't have developed right. such sophisticated mm -hmm. societies because they're savages because mm -hmm. we were committing genocide right. and you can't, you, explain that. you can't respect people <laughs> right. you're committing they genocide on. Right. So they have to be uh, unhuman savages. Right. So there must've been a light skinned race yeah. that built these beautiful civilizations. And that's all in the air when Joseph Smith in the right. 1820s right. And yeah. And yeah. him and others come up with, explanations there must have been a white skinned version of these native americans that were actually smart and capable yeah. and right. that's where that's where the nephite and lamanite story springs out of sorry i just wanted no, to fill that, that in. was beautiful what you said <laughs> yeah and i think that for me was a clincher because i always want to understand why people do things well why would joseph smith just make up a book like that but then to know people were trying to explain back then they were trying to explain uh, just what you said. And, and then to see the Book of Mormon in that light of he was making up the story about white people then becoming unrighteous and being banished by the not white people. Which also is super racist. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And just put it in context. The dark skin curse. Yeah. And yeah, of, oh. Let's make them dark so they're so they're loathsome. Right. Dark and loathsome yeah. to right. the to the lighter skin. Yeah. But we're not racist. Because so. they're because they're wicked. Yeah. That's a super racist. The whole book of the Mormon. Book. The, the, yeah, yeah. Not even the foundation. specific yeah. verses that people quote, but the entire foundation yeah. is racist. Yeah. 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 Okay, really quick. So Sarah you guys have been living the Mormon dream. You've been packing down all these feminist inklings. You guys reached the, the pinnacle of kind of first level Mormonism, which is Bishop and Bishop's wife. You're in Ammon, Idaho, where you grew up. And then your husband gets released and he starts going down the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. what, what's that like for you as you're watching him go down the rabbit hole? <laughs> well, 
I think I have to back up a little bit because I feel like I was somewhat prepared to to handle what ha- was happening to him. So I was it 2018? Yeah, 2018. I actually started a counseling program. So I started a master's program in mental health counseling. Through and, Idaho State, mm-hmm. or okay, yeah, and. Um, Sam's scrupulo- Sam Jr.'s scrupulosity was kind of the catalyst for that. Do Got we want to really talk about that first passionate. or not? Or um, uh, About the scrupulosity? Is there anything or... you guys want to mention about that? No pressure. Well, no pressure. Just whatever you want. Um, I guess just very briefly, I'm Bishop, and he's having this. Do you want to tell it? Uh, sure. <laughs> no pressure. Only yeah. what you're comfortable with. No, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so... I guess, I don't know how far we want to go into this, but um, uh, to give the brief overview, I started developing, I guess, scrupulosity. Tell Uh, our listeners what that means. Mm -hmm. um, For me, it meant an extreme, uh, compulsively obsessive, uh, it's tied to OCD, um, uh, compulsively obsessive, uh, you know. Religiosity. Religiosity in this case, yes, absolutely. You know, I and again with that being Bishop, uh, I would uh, uh, be watching a movie and I'd be attracted or <laughs> I'd have feelings of attraction towards uh, a woman and I'd be like, "Holy crap!" You know, like it wasn't just <laughs> go it wasn't confess. just, "Hey, mom and dad, like like what's going on?" It was in my mind, you know, there would be these compulsively obsessive cycles that I could not control, and there's a whole history to that. But yeah. I'm, uh, when it comes to how that affected me and the church, I think I, I won't say that the church caused that for me personally, although I can definitely see how it could be the catalyst for that. Um, but it absolutely facilitated it. And so that so was you had a lot experience. of feelings of guilt and shame. Oh, absolutely. And, for and feeling was, sexual feelings. And, and, a and lot not of just different that. Things. I mean, yeah. it was legitimately, ins- it was insanity as far as I was concerned. I, I, uh, Why? What do you mean? I wasn't capable of, uh, it's hard to put into words because it's not just I wasn't capable of reason or I wasn't capable of seeing clearly. It was not only the compulsive and obsessive uh, aspects of it. It was also like every single thing I did had the potential to become something that, you know, consumed my mind for hours or days or weeks, right? Like everything had that potential. And so then on one hand, it turns into constant fear. Like, and this, at its worst, it probably lasted about two years, um, 10 to 12, roughly, I think for me. Um, And so it was a matter of you're living in constant fear. And when you're always thinking like, it's going to go off, you know, I'm going to have some huge, um, downward spiral into uh, being terrified of having sinned, right, having to confess, Um, then I, you know, that makes it far easier to have those problems begin, to have that downward spiral begin in the first place. And one thing that um, was huge, and I don't know if our interactions on that basis with me confessing, like, multiple times in a single day sometimes to yeah. different incidents that I thought were like, you know, I was damned to hell basically because of this, if I didn't confess. Like, I, I definitely remember asking some questions. Like, like I, I wanted, because of this uh, dangerous mental condition, I was like, I want basically like, like what is it that I have to confess to? Because like worrying about it and trying to figure it out because – especially with the bishop being your dad, like it's torture to try to say, hey, dad, here's this personally embarrassing thing that I feel like is horrible, right? Um, I, I was the worrying about what was or was not something I needed to confess about that was the real problem for me. And so, yeah, I, I kept coming to you and saying, you know, like, like what's the, the to-do list basically of like this is when and how you need to confess. And that was something that many conversations circulated around and – and I'm, I'm not sure if that – if the culmination of all of those interactions influenced at all your uh, – That wasn't part of my faith right. crisis sure. or transition or anything, but it was part of yours. Mm-hmm. Mm. So let me just let me just try and understand this. And we've covered scrupulosity in the past on Mormon Stories. Check it out. It's hyper uh, – hyper-religiosity, uh, trying to manage your thoughts – 
taking the gospel very, very literally to the point where you're literally fearing death, in, in interpreting scriptures like to have a thought, a sexual thought is as, is as bad as committing adultery, that it's that it's near murder in in severity. And so you've got these teens or young adults thinking they're almost murderers if they have a bad thought or do what normal teens do to kind of express their sexual urges or feelings. Mm -hmm. And there's a level to which that's all of us. That's you. That's me. That's just like, oh, oops, we goofed up. We had bad thoughts. And that's the shame cycle is kind of what it means to be Mormon, you know? Right. But then there's a point where it crosses the line and becomes clinical, where, yeah. where either the OCD is just eating up hours and hours a day, or you're hyper-confessing, hyper-praying, hyper-serving, even to the point where it's starting to severely impact your mental health, anxiety, depression, and then sometimes suicidality become very severe. So my, my question, to whatever extent you're comfortable sharing, is was there a point where it kind of crosses the line and it's not just like, whoa, he's like really righteous and really conscientious, yeah. Yeah. where you're starting to be worried for his emotional or physical safety. And whoever, uh, and you, you, you know, okay, so. <laughs> well, as Bishop, as he said, it, it, it was bad. Multiple times a day sometimes. He's what? He would be coming to me and say, hey, Dad, I need to talk to you at home. Not even he works like, from home. yeah, I work from home. So uh, you're trying to get work done. Well, I mean, it's not a, a nuisance to talk. <laughs> well, I guess it did, it did become a problem. Like yeah. multiple times a day, yeah. uh, a day uh, he'd come, need to confess something that he had already confessed that didn't need to be confessed. He would write letters confessing all of these things. And, uh, and it didn't matter what counsel I gave, it didn't matter what. I so you would him, say like, things like, yeah, you don't need to confess that. Don't confess. Like, <laughs> here you've got a bishop saying, don't Stop confess. And, and it, it didn't help. Like, it, it didn't. Yeah. So when right. he says to you, don't confess, what, what goes through your mind? Well, well, um, <laughs> <laughs> at, at its worst, um, during the times where I imagine you'd be tempted to be yelling, stop confessing, more or less. Um, it was seriously just an inability to compute the like to process the idea of not confessing, and partly because, as you mentioned, it's it, it's everything regarding religion is literal in a, an increasingly toxic way. Um, I remember reading scriptures in my diligent, righteous uh, scripture study time. Uh, you know, like he who takes the Lord's name in vain, like will not be forgiven, right. and I'm like. Crap! You know, like, yeah. Holy yeah. crap! I'm, yeah. I am screwed. And so then I'd come to mom and dad, and be like, "Help me! Um, I'm really gonna, you know, like, like I believed it, and so you know, I believe it. And then there's if this, you have the thought, or if you're the words slip right. out, then right. you're damned. Yeah, exactly. And so then, like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do with this? So yeah, if my dad, as bishop, would say, "Stop confessing," I'm like. No, no, no. Like you don't, you don't get it. You don't understand. And I guess that not just with re the religious aspect of scrupulosity, but also with OCD and other delusions, right? When you're in a certain mental state, it's like, you just don't understand, right? Like you, <laughs> yeah. you don't get it. And, and that's the, that's the real tragedy is when uh, obviously, again, there's a mental component that isn't, wasn't for me completely tied to um, religion, but you know, there, I, I felt like, unfortunately, there was actually or remains some sort of basis for my actions in the scriptures, meaning that if I studied something and read a scripture like that, like I interpret it in the way that's worse for my <laughs> eternal happiness. And then, you know, why not? Like, why not have that be something that's all consuming? So it was definitely a vicious cycle that was again, facilitated by religion. And at the core, I'm sure you're worried that you won't go to the celestial kingdom, that your family won't be a forever family, oh, yeah. like the stakes, I'm guessing were super high for you. Yeah. And that's something that we've talked about at length is when you have this idea of, of eternity and of like, oh my gosh, there's the celestial kingdom. There's these things like this idea of, I could be the, the weak link that makes so that our the family empty chair, right? Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like that's, that's, terrifying and then um you know as you begin to 
start to develop in, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, whatever age it is, you start to sort of uh, think about the world in more abstract ways and develop your sort of worldview and perception. You know, when all of that baggage comes along, I think that, yeah, for me at least, that was hugely devastating in terms of my my capability to be competent in uh, in in handling difficult ideas, um, especially around religion. So what you guys were saying, when did you start getting worried that this was potentially clinical? I think there's always... I, <laughs> Go ahead. I think we were worried. I was worried from the beginning, mm-hmm. but I, I had no like you, it, you could what just say it's a righteous son, a super righteous son. No. no. <laughs> because it... It was bad. Because he was confessing constantly, and we would he would talk to me like, he confessed again or four times today. And we, I had no clue what was going on. And, and he, there were some other manifestations. Like he stopped touching us. Mm. If we, if I walked past him in a room, he would like maintain do it. this like weird well, thing to get out of the way. So he was like never within six close. feet of anyone. Because what was he, that about? Can you, do you know what that was about? I like to think I saw the coronavirus coming early, but <laughs> at the time it was so, so there were specific ideas, right? There were specific ideas like you touching someone, like your mind's going to, because of this twisted, you know, mess that I had gotten myself into with religion, it was like if I touch someone, it doesn't matter who, it doesn't matter why, it doesn't matter how, but like it, it's – you're, I'm always a, a step away from like making a move that with the right perceived intentions in my mind means that I'm guilty of some damnable sin. Like, like, like touching, molesting your mom or something sexual. Yeah. Right? Well, yes, yeah, sexual stuff. And, and the, the worst moment that the worst memory I have of this at all, we were at Yellowstone national park. We were having a good time. It was on this big family road trip. And, you know, I was in the midst of the worst of this and we were walking by like, um, you know, like Like the big pools and all that stuff. Right. And I'm like, looking back, I imagine I must've looked like a zombie or something, but it was seriously like head down. And and what I was paralyzed of, like for, for hours, like the whole time we were there was like, if I, if my foot like shifted and in my brain, like the idea of like that pushing someone into the, like I was guilty. You might kill someone. Yeah. Like, Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing. Like, I wasn't homicidal. I right. wasn't some homicidal right. kid. Yeah. I obviously don't want and have never wanted to kill anyone. But once I had gone down the rabbit hole of that, the mental twisting and whatnot, um, yeah, like, like, well, well, if me like brushing shoulders with someone is like basically like, like me wanting to rape them or something like, why not? Like, like, like murder and all these horrible things are just a step away when that's the kind of thing that's being um, repeatedly driven into your mind every day. So yeah, like it got to the point where paranoias, um, not being able to trust other people's, uh, other people telling me like dad and mom telling me like what was horrible and what was just like, like chill out, you know, uh, not being able to perceive what reality was and not being able to understand, uh, the difference between a thought and like an an intent I think in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Olivia, is there is there anything you want to add as you kind of uh, were experiencing your your brother uh, going through all this? Is there anything you want to add in terms of just what you were experiencing at the time? Um, did I, you notice this? Did you know what was going on? Yeah, to some degree, not as much as I should have or could have, because um, I I wish I could formulate my words better. Like a lot of this has been kind of pushed down, and it's not like easy for me to talk about but yeah I did notice that he was very obsessive and um you know we I remember like we'd go to the stores and he would just be like you know you'd see magazines with girls with like wearing Mm -hmm. bras or whatever you just like look away and I was always like Sam like loosen up you know but I also understood it to a degree I never had it as bad as him but I like you were saying like I think cycles of shame is um just part of being Mormon and I definitely had um especially entering on women's for at least a year just like that intense obsessiveness with being perfectly righteous and um a little definitely some fear um that you know i was gonna go to hell or whatever so Mm. so sorry yeah well and just to just to make sure that this is perfectly clear again i i i can only speak for myself but i definitely don't think 
as far as I'm aware, that like religion is something that brings people on a consistent basis to the level like I was at. Like obviously scrupulosity is a spectrum, right? I assume that not everyone has like years of crippling uh, mental illness. But for me, not only did the o OCD already exist pre any religious involvement, um, it was also like it was to such an extreme point that, again, it was like it was beyond functioning was impossible. And so I, I just don't want to uh, give the idea that that's like some guarantee or common that level, at least, is a common occurrence. I hope it's not right in regards to religiosity. No, we, we've covered this a lot on a few scrupulosity episodes. But basically, the, the general feeling in the mental health industry is that religions don't cause scrupulosity. It's more that OCD attacks the things you care about most. So if you're in a high demand Orthodox religion right. and it's the religious stuff you care most about, then if you have OCD, which is often genetic um, and it's an anxiety disorder, then it's going to manifest as scrupulosity instead of hoarding or safety or cleanliness or the other forms of OCD. Right. Now, but I also think it is fair to say that a high demand religion exacerbates uh this and kind of prime someone for it and can can add the stakes and the pressure uh, to the level where it can become very unhealthy and even deadly. So it's not that religion is totally off the hook here. A lot of the scriptures, a lot of the teachings, bad leaders can take a, a situation that's bad and turn it worse and even deadly. So we don't blame religion for scrupulosity, but but when high demand religions get out of control, uh, they, they can they can exacerbate it and and make it really awful. Yeah, absolutely. So, and so I think the scrupulosity started, I started noticing it after I became bishop. There was some evidence of OCD before that, but the mm -hmm. scrupulosity started after yeah. I became bishop. And you were, yeah, you were so. saying, Sarah, that, that as you noticed him going through this, it, it was the beginnings of, of, maybe some unraveling for you is that kind no of? not at all okay no but <laughs> but it led so to i was just seeing my son suffer mm. and i had no idea why i didn't know what was going on did it seem serious like oh, potentially absolutely. very serious what was your biggest fear um, was there a rock it bottom it was like watching him change before my eyes like losing my son you were like, losing him yeah like i i didn't recognize him anymore he 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 acted different he looked different he was a he couldn't function like he just wasn't my Sam anymore. And that's really hard as a mom. Um, and I knew about OCD, but I thought it was like the hand washing thing. I had, I'd never heard of any religious thing like that. And so I was praying, I'm sure we were all praying for him and not having any clue what was going on. And then I was at the library one day and I saw I'm kind of, I love books and books have often come into my life at just right time and kind of saved me. So I saw this book that had OCD on the cover really big and I just felt it like this magnetic pull to go pick up that book. And I thought, but that's not what Sam has. That's not what's going on. And, but I picked it up and I looked through the table of contents and it had scrupulosity religious. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's religious OCD. And it was, so from that point on, we start. I started researching, and I really wanted to find someone who did ERP treatment, which is exposure, exposure ritual, yeah, response prevention, yeah, because yeah. um, that seemed like it had good evidence for it. And there wasn't anyone locally who did that, so we actually drove to the OCD and Anxiety Center in Bountiful. Yeah, yeah, and they diagnosed him, and they they said it was severe based on the intake paperwork and. And they wanted us to come like four days a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very intensive there. And so I was like, well, we, we have to do this because he, he, it was crippling and he was suffering. Um, so we drove home to talk about it. Let me just ask, was there a rock bottom moment where you're like, that, something that led to you uh, being willing to go to the center? Well, it seemed to be getting progressively worse. And mm -hmm. that road trip that he mentioned, being in Yellowstone, yeah. he was physically paralyzed yeah. it was he couldn't walk he couldn't get up off the bench because he thought he would knock people into the hot pools so yeah i think that was rock bottom and and now i know we were doing everything wrong because we were constantly reassuring him which is the worst thing for ocd 
but we had no idea, mm. right? You just try to be a normal parent and just say, So you're it's offering okay. the reassurance, the reassurance. Yep. And that's, for those who don't know, the way that OCD works is you have these intrusive, obsessive thoughts, and then you, you develop compulsive behaviors to neutralize the anxiety you're experiencing. And so the confession and or the seeking reassurance or the rumination becomes the compulsive behavior. So if your family is in the role of reassuring you, then they're feeding into this codependent, super unhealthy, toxic relationship of them actually increasing and augmenting and strengthening your compulsive behaviors. And it's 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 really awful, but you're just trying to be loving, reassuring right? parents, right? Yeah. 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 And <laughs> so anyway, we came home from the clinic and we're talking about what, how to move forward. We didn't have insurance that covered mental health. We... It's expensive. It's yeah, so expensive. It's like there. eight grand, right? And we don't yeah, live in Utah, there. so how are we right going to be? Yeah, there? you didn't live there. How'd right. you do that? Drove. Well, we didn't. We didn't ever <laughs> well, attend the clinic. Oh, you didn't do no, it. No, he yeah. was actually put on the waiting list, and then um, I, st I was becoming passionate. You know, Mother Bear coming out, becoming passionate about mental health, and I <gasps> came downstairs to Sam's office one day, and I said, "I have something I want to tell you," and he's like, "You want to become a counselor, don't you?" It's like, how did you know? But just the fact that there weren't counselors that knew the therapy, yeah. mm -hmm. it really got to me. And I thought this is a void in our community. And, and so I decided to go yeah. become a counselor. And, and but I, then he spontaneously got better. Well, well it, it wasn't yeah, wait, like, wait, wait, it wasn't immediately, yeah, uh, well, but we never on. went to the clinic. It, so if I may, I think that this might actually be a source of relative confusion still. <laughs> okay. So, so, so ironically enough, um, my recovery, I actually attributed to God, um, you know, for some obvious reasons, I guess. But um, what happened was basically I, we had just gone to a cabin. It was in sort of one of the lulls because, you know, it gets worse and better and worse and better. Um, and it was during the time when it was horrible, right? Um, uh, I kind of had a system in place of how I confess, though, like, because it was just a given that, you know, on a daily or weekly basis, confessions would be happening. But we went to a cabin with some friends and, you know, one of these things happened, um, which was ridiculous, right, which is obvious to me. Um, now, uh, I went and confessed to dad and I could definitely tell him that I remember being able to tell in that moment, like, dad was just like, 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 dude, like, like, like what, <laughs> like, what is this? Like, like, you know, it wasn't anger or anything, obviously, but it was just, this is not a problem, right? And so I, I cannot, like, nothing was super different about that. I remember it because it was a recovery or the moment of recovery. But for some reason, like, like seriously, I, I cannot, I've thought about, it, I cannot fathom a reason for why it suddenly changed. But I think there's a technical term for it. Whatever grip um, the disease had in my mind was just, like, broken. A and I didn't do anything. But suddenly I could think in a manner which it, like like actually rationalized reasons not to have this compulsive obsessive cycle right and so from there on out i i've expressed in the past like like guys like this is like that was it like it was over like after that i was it, it was done i i didn't uh, i didn't feel the need to confess and stuff and so as i think you were about to mention like apparently there was sort of a petering out of the actual like confessions and weird activities and things like that but like i i knew and it was really a source of like constant joy for me like i i knew like it's over like like it's changed now like yeah. like i'm free a and so you know i there were still actions kind of leading um out of that you know um it didn't all just totally disappear overnight but my mindset has like had fundamentally changed somehow. what was the shift was it that my dad can't forgive me was it that god loves me no matter what like what was the shift i think the shift was and again i have no idea why it happened but the shift was really going from um okay let's say i hit olivia on the shoulder oh my gosh i'm an incestuous 13 year old okay that's a crazy thought <laughs> Sorry, it might be awkward. <laughs> um, uh, it, it goes from like that as like a possibility. Then I'm like examining myself like, well, t am I an incestuous 13 year old? Like, like was did I have some intention? And then I dig up these emotions and ideas. Right. And like I, I search for an answer that I search for an answer to a question that shouldn't exist. Right. Because. That's not a normal, uh, uh, that's not normal mental functioning. And so it went kind of from that sort of cyclical mentality to um, I was just able to understand the nature of my actions and intents. I, I, 
I think that's the best way to put it, right? So I hit Olivia on the shoulder and it's like, I hit her on the shoulder. Now it went from, oh my goodness, like I've sinned against the Lord, the church, and all that is good and beautiful in this world to, okay, I, like, like it, it's a, it's nothing, right? Mm. Because everything that I obsessed over was l- like quite literally nothing. It was mm-hmm. just absolute nonsense. And so, I, again, I don't know but why. But that's I put almost that like a shit. miracle. Like it's yeah, really it rare. <laughs> For this just to spontaneously, you know, usually you have to go through months, if not years, of what you called exposure and ritual prevention or ERP, mm-hmm. exposure therapy, where you're paying eight grand to go to this clinic, inpatient or outpatient, and you're just for months doing these exposures with these therapists, with all these other kids, so that over time you can learn to develop acceptance of your thoughts, holding your thoughts and feelings loosely, and learn to stop performing the compulsions that then feed feed the, you know, so this is almost like a Saul on the road to Damascus, um, the younger moment in the mental health realm that you just all of a sudden, like cold Turkey had this aha moment. I mean, it, it kind of is a miracle. Yeah. yeah. We don't I have think an explanation. we considered it that I, he did seem to get better. And also when we went to the clinic, she diagnosed him and she said, you are no longer allowed to confess. And I learned I'm not supposed to reassure him. So that could have been part of what helped, right? Is that we stopped that enabling behavior. Spoiler, I confessed anyway. <laughs> I, I, a couple I, times. Well, yeah, I did, I did get my better. Best. Our but. behaviors changed. So. Right. Okay, so you stopped enabling it and that helped. It helped. A little bit of education. Yeah. Some education yeah, absolutely, helped. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, but it wasn't the but only thing. I think we did consider it a miracle. And at that point, so from the time we went to the clinic to when we were like the we were waitlisted and when they called and said he can come now he was better so how i made meaning of it at that point was by then i was looking up programs and deciding to become a counselor how i made meaning of it was well maybe i'm just supposed to become a counselor but <laughs> my son had to suffer for that i don't know but and then once i decided that he got better that's how, it, it was a coincidence anyway i so a thought that I have in all of that, so you were planning on going to school. We had been homeschooling, and that was going to stop now since she's starting her own master's program. And so Sam would be going to high school. He was... Middle school. Uh, middle school. Yeah. He was socially isolated. He wasn't having opportunities every day to bump up against <laughs> people. And so there's some uh, exposure that was coming and we talked about i remember talking in the backyard are we going to do this clinic or are we going to try and see what happens with you going and being exposed to more social interaction that way and see if that helps and we decided to give it a try and yeah and that was something that the therapist at the ocd clinic did say was because he tries not to touch people being in public school where he's walking through the halls and he has to touch people constantly will really help. So he was pretty, I feel like you were pretty much better by the time school started. Yeah. But, but then that probably helped to maintain any progress. Well, yeah. And, and again, uh, not surprisingly, I put quite a bit of thought into how the whole recovery process happened. And I think basically there was that, that like definitive moment where I knew like suddenly my entire ability to reason and comprehend reality, the reality of things was magically transformed, right? And then it was like the actions petered out, right? And I think that that was basically done by the time that, you know, I started going to public school. But then, yeah, you know, you still have very powerful remnants of the mental processes and um, cyclical patterns, right? But because of the magical transformation, now I could understand those for what they were and they weren't compulsive and uncontrollable and so then yeah you know i think that um there's no doubt that me interacting with people uh at public school uh helped reduce or you know change those a lot of exposures right absolutely yeah Yeah, but but it didn't i I don't think it actually changed it it wasn't the cure right it didn't stop the mental start but it absolutely helped yeah that makes sense so all those exposures you know if you're home if you're isolated homeschooled you can really live in your room and you can really kind right. of isolate if you're out of school and all these, all these girls walking around right. and all these thoughts right. you can be having, maybe that, that served as a, as a way to give you some exposure. 
Yeah, and yeah. I've been talking a ton, so I, I don't want to take yeah. up all the time in the world. Um, one more thing I will say, though, is, yeah, that first of all, that's absolutely true. And it's also true that, um, I guess, with all of this, you really start to realize just how how hard like how important it is at least this was my experience i i kind of thought like wow it's really important for me to understand and control how i think and so then that like led strongly again with my amazing parents who are very uh even at this time under <laughs> uh, within the church were very reasonable and loved to reason and to think about things and to study things and taught me how to think critically. You know, that all transformed me into someone who was relatively decent at thinking through things and being critical and somewhat objective. And so that, I mean, we're going to get there. I don't want to rush ahead, but that definitely also played a role in allow improving my ability to accept uh, my dad leaving the church and then me leaving soon after. Okay. 